Hello, this is Dr. David Saperstein. I'm the director of the Center for Complex Neurology, EDS, and POTS in Scottsdale, Arizona. I'd like to provide a series of talks that address Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome in different ways. What it is, how it's diagnosed, how it can be treated, and conditions that can be associated with it. This first talk will focus on what is Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Well, the complicated explanation is that Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, or EDS, is an inherited group of connective tissue disorders that are characterized by abnormal collagen synthesis that affects skin, ligaments, joints, blood vessels, and other organs. A more simple explanation, it's a group of inherited disorders causing a wide array of symptoms. And these can vary from patient to patient, even among members of the same family. Another way to look at EDS is that it's a significantly underappreciated and very much incompletely understood group of inherited disorders. It's a diagnosis that more and more many patients are making on their own, and it's a condition that is difficult to treat, to say the least. A brief history of EDS. It's actually one of the oldest known causes of bruising and bleeding, and it was first described by Hippocrates back in 400 BC. In 1901, Edvard Ehlers uh, recognized the condition as a distinct entity. A short time later, in 1908, Henri Alexander Danlos suggested that skin extensibility and fragility were the core features of the syndrome. In the 1960s, the genetic features of this disorder were first appreciated. In 1998, a geneticist in England, Baton, published the classification of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And initial uh, classifications were the so-called V-Franche nosology. And then very recently, in 2017, some new diagnostic uh, criteria were created. We'll talk about those later. So what are the manifestations of EDS? There are many. It affects joints and joints can be extra mobile and slide out of place, also known as subluxation, or they can completely come out of place and need to be put back in, that's a dislocation. There could be pain in joints, and there frequently is, and all of this can lead to early arthritis. Skin is affected, so there can be easy bruising and bleeding. There can be easy scarring. Not all of these things occur in every patient with EDS. Many patients get cardiovascular manifestations, particularly something called the postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or POTS. There's a separate lecture on that. As with other tissues that can be abnormally lax or stretchy, the heart valves can be affected, and it can be leaky valves. The large arteries coming off of the heart, especially the aorta, can be abnormal. There can be aneurysms. Gastrointestinal symptoms are commonly seen in people with EDS. This can range from something called gastroparesis, where the stomach just doesn't move like it should. There can be abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation. Neurological symptoms are quite common as well. Headaches occur very often, and a number of patients will experience numbness. There are complications during pregnancy. Women's joints can become even more loose and lax while they're pregnant or in the immediate postpartum period. Women with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome are predisposed to going into labor early or having something called premature rupture of membranes where the water breaks too soon. There are ophthalmological and dental manifestations as well. A number of patients can experience Issues with allergy or with their immune system. This can range from rashes or food allergies and sensitivities, asthma, they can even have anaphylaxis. And there may be an increased tendency towards autoimmune disorders. Some other conditions that seem to be more common in EDS as well are polycystic ovary syndrome, autistic spectrum disorders, and attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. Not surprisingly, from what I've just said, there's a large number of specialists who potentially can become involved with EDS. 
in alphabetical order. Allergists, immunologists, cardiologists, dentists, dietitians, gastroenterologists, geneticists, OBGYNs, occupational therapists, orthopedists, orthotists who create braces uh, for joints and splints, neurologists, neurosurgeons, pain management physicians, psychologists, physical therapists, rheumatologists. There could be quite a bit of difficulty in diagnosing EDS, and organizations like the Ehlers Demo Society and other organizations have come a long way in making information accessible to people. People can learn about these diseases on the internet. And the, uh, the logo for the Ehlers Dental Society is the zebra. And the significance of the zebra is in medical school, um, doctors in training are often taught to think that if they hear horse, horse beats, they should think that that could be coming from horses rather than zebras because it's far more likely to have horses around than zebras. And so, unfortunately, in medical school, we're often taught to think that zebras are rare. So again, the zebra is a rare condition. Um, it turns out that Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, at least certain forms, like the hypermobile form, are actually quite common. So unfortunately, when patients tell a physician or other provider that they think they may have EDS, they're told that that's probably not the case simply because that's a very uncommon condition to have. A larger problem leading to difficulties of diagnosis is that so many different things can happen with EDS and they can resemble other more common conditions. And if you're a specialist in one condition, you're gonna to tend to focus on what you specialize in and focus on some set of symptoms and maybe underappreciate other symptoms. So this brings us to a different animal. So instead of the zebra, the elephant, and this is from an old parable talking about several blind men who were trying to determine what an elephant was like and it was just based on touching it. So based on what part of the elephant they happened to touch, they decided this is what an elephant was. So a man touching the tusk would think an elephant was like a spear. Another blind man who felt the trunk thought it was like a snake. A blind man who felt one of the legs determined that elephants were like a tree. If someone touched the ear, they decided it was like a fan. Touching the bulk of the elephant itself, they decided an elephant was like a wall. And the man who felt the tail decided an elephant was like a rope. So if we substitute these literal structures of the elephant and talk about some of the features of EDS, you could see that, again, based on the symptoms that someone focuses on or what their specialty is, they may decide the patient has one thing and not see the larger picture. So a primary care doctor or a rheumatologist may decide that the person has fibromyalgia based on joint pain, based on other pain. Uh, a neurologist may decide that migraines is the main problem. A primary care doctor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist may decide that anxiety is the major picture. Uh, again, a rheumatologist may focus on the joint issues and diagnose arthritis. A cardiologist may focus on cardiac issues. So patients can have POTS or they can have rapid heart rate and get diagnosed with something called IST or uh, idiopathic sinus tachycardia. And a gastroenterologist would maybe give a diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome. So as you can see, EDS has many faces. And I just want to further bring this home by giving you some other examples of some different ways that different patients can present. So for instance, a doctor may say Mary, who's a 40-year-old woman, she's coming in reporting that she's being bothered by joint pain, some lightheadedness, she often gets stomach bloating, and she feels fatigue and describes brain fog where it's hard to concentrate or hard to focus. In contrast, there's Sarah, who's a 16-year-old girl. She was doing great, then had an episode of mononucleosis, and ever since then, she's been having problems with fainting and quite significant nausea and vomiting. She's always been double-jointed, but it doesn't pose any problems for her. Then there's Robert, a 50-year-old man. For the last several years, he's been bothered by migraines, problems with TMJ or temporal mandibular joint dysfunction, so his jaw clicks and he gets soreness in the jaw when he eats things that are chewy. 
he does not have any lightheadedness, but notes that often he feels palpitations, feels that his heart is beating harder or there's extra heartbeats. And uh, in fact, he's been diagnosed with uh, mitral valve regurgitation, so some leakage due to stretchiness of his, uh, some of his heart valves. And lastly, there's Carol, a 20-year-old woman. She has very severe allergies. She reacts to a lot of things. She gets rashes from this. She has asthma and she gets hives. And those are really the only symptoms that are bothering her. So coming back to that question, what is EDS? Again, it's a group of inherited disorders caused by abnormal collagen production. But what, what does that mean? Well, it causes a number of issues. It certainly affects joints in the skin, causing problems with them. Joints are abnormally mobile, leading to joints slipping out of place, leading to joint pain and early arthritis. And all joints can be infected can be affected to include those in the neck, back, and jaw. Skin may or may not be affected. When skin is affected, it may be abnormally stretchy, and uh, some patients will, have, will experience abnormal healing or bruising. There's lots that can happen with EDS, as you'll see through these talks, but day in and day out when I see patients in my office, I, I'm struck by how commonly there's six very common issues that occur. Again, joint issues, as we've talked about, POTS is very common, gastrointestinal symptoms, the presence of migraines or at least frequent headaches, temporal mandibular joint dysfunction, and something called mast cell activation syndrome. There's an entire lecture on this. Mast cells are a type of white blood cell involved in allergic reactions. And basically, with mast cell activation syndrome, the allergic system has gone a little haywire. And people will react like they're having an allergic reaction, but there may, there's often no rhyme or reason to this. Sometimes they'll do fine with exposure to a food or some other uh, contact with something. And other times that will cause itching or redness or flushing. Um, there can be gastrointestinal symptoms. So eating food, any food, will sometimes cause stomach discomfort, bloating, diarrhea. So... EDS, again, is a group of disorders affecting collagen. At the current time, 13 different forms have been identified. There's the so-called classical form. There's the classical-like form. Again, these are different genes causing different types. Uh, the so-called cardiac valvular EDS, where not surprisingly based on the name, cardiac manifestations are more common. There's the very dreaded vascular EDS, we'll talk more about that in detail in just a bit. There's hypermobile EDS, which is far and away the most common form. Arthrochalasia, dermatospraxis, kyphoscoliotic, I'm sorry, kyphoscoliotic. Uh, these are all much rarer forms affecting joints or skin or, or causing bends in the spine. Uh, there's brittle cornea syndrome, which as the name suggests, mostly affects the eyes, but there are forms where joint hypermobility and other issues known to be uh, manifestations of EDS can occur, uh, and other much rarer conditions or entities as well. The three most common forms of EDS are classical, hypermobile, and vascular, and of those three, hypermobile is far and away the most common. So classical EDS is uh, where people's skin is very stretchy. And by and large, if you go to a physician and say you have EDS, their knowledge of EDS from medical school, because very few physicians in medical uh, through the course of their medical school or, or post-medical school training will have had much familiarity with EDS. So uh, if your skin isn't very stretchy, they may think that you don't have EDS or couldn't have EDS. Again, certainly we see people with this degree of stretchy skin, but this is, is, is not particularly common. There are other skin manifestations that can occur, ranging from mild scarring that you see going from left to right, uh, tends to occur on certain areas of the body, like knees and elbows. Uh, you see towards the right-hand side with the last two pictures of the knees, much more severe and permanent scarring that occurs, even some bleeding that leads into that leads to a hyperpigmentation of the scars, and these are characteristic features of the classical form of EDS. And then here are even more pronounced 
forms. And you see on, on the right, the so-called cigarette paper phenomenon, where you see the skin becomes very thin and whitish. Hypermobile EDS, or HEDS, as I said, is the most common form. It's often misdiagnosed, and there's a video devoted just to the diagnosis of that. So what is this picture? This is a, this is a ghost. I say that because uh, hypermobile EDS is often an invisible disease. Uh, many times uh, it is young women who are presenting to their doctor and they hear the same thing. Well, you look healthy. Your tests are normal. And so it's a diagnosis that's often overlooked. Vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is a condition where blood vessels are particularly fragile and susceptible to problems. Problems like aneurysms or the arteries just spontaneously tearing. These patients will usually have a very characteristic appearance to their face and their skin is uh, very translucent and their veins are very prominent. Patients with various forms of EDS, to include hypermobile, may have some prominence of their veins and, and so they often become alarmed thinking they might have vascular, but uh, again, uh, what we see in the vascular EDS patients is, is quite striking. Um, on the left is a picture of a woman with very typical features of vascular EDS, so prominent eyes, larger than normal eyes, sunken in eyes, thin bridge of the nose, uh, characteristic appearance to the rest of the nose, sunken in ch cheeks, and thin lips. And then the woman on the right is uh, also has vascular EDS, but again, her facial features are not as striking as the woman's on the left. You can see from this picture that her ears are kind of lower, than they should be, and it's not well seen in either of those pictures, but another characteristic feature that may be seen in vascular EDS is that uh, the ears don't have prominent earlobes. So the problems that are unique to vascular EDS, like blood vessel rupture or even rupture of organs, such as intestines or uterus, usually occur at a young age. So they occur by age 30 in many patients, and this number approaches 80% by age 40. Um, joint hypermobility occurs in vascular EDS, but it is usually much less prominent in vascular EDS compared to other forms of EDS, such as the hypermobile form. And when it does occur, it is usually largely conf uh, confined to the hands or other small joints. So all forms of EDS are genetic disorders. And a genetic disease occurs when a portion of a person's genetic material, which is called a gene, uh, has an abnormality in it, and this causes a certain protein to be made incorrectly. So this abnormality occurring in the gene is referred to as a mutation. Some mutations need to occur in both copies of a gene to cause disease. This is called a recessive disorder. So recall that we receive one gene from each parent. So again, each gene uh, is made up of a pair, one from mother, one from father. Uh, a dominant disorder occurs if just a single copy of a gene is abnormal. Therefore, only one of your parents needs to harbor uh, an abnormal gene, and then the disease can be passed on. So most of the forms of EDS are inherited in, in an autosomal dominant fashion. For reasons that are unclear, members of the fa same family who have the same gene mutation can vary quite wide widely in how the EDS affects them. Some family members can be essentially asymptomatic, whereas another family member can have very severe manifestations. This, understandably, can make it difficult to determine that a given patient has a genetic condition. I encourage you to look at the other talks to learn more information about EDS. Thank you.